Welcome to Trafficking Truths. I'm Rebecca Bender, and this is our Mythbuster campaign. Today is Myth 7. It's our last one, and I was going to feed you some of my favorite one-liners, but I want you to know that today is about good data, and I've got all my favorite one-liners for you. But I have brought on special guest, Dr. Angie Henderson from the University of Northern Colorado, a resident expert, Elizabeth Scaife, and survivor, leader, and activist, Tara Madison. We're going to talk about good data, the importance of it, how to come through it, how to find it, what happens when you click one of the citable links and where exactly you should look. We teach you how to quickly understand and verify credible sources. I can't wait to dive in. Let's get started. Awesome. Well, I am so excited. Today we are joined by Dr. Angie Henderson yep. from the Avery Center and the University of Northern Colorado. You have you wear many hats. Yep. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and your your expertise that you're bringing today. We're so excited to have you with us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm excited. Um, so I am a professor. I've been a professor, uh, man, I've been doing this for like 15 years. It's wow. Unbelievable to me to think about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm at UNC. I'm a full professor in the sociology department. And um, my area of research has always been gender, um, the way that women are sort of viewed in society, the ways that they present themselves. And so when I stumbled upon and met survivor leader Megan Lundstrom, I like my mind was blown um, and I then started working with her and the Avery Center at the time it was Free Our Girls. She needed data collected for her organization because um, as we all know, a lot of these nonprofits, they, they run on grant funding. And unless you do program evaluation of your grant, uh, you're not really gonna get renewed. So we started gathering data and I've interviewed to date over 70 survivors and victims, people who are currently being exploited of sex trafficking. So that's quickly become my area of focus. And I love, I love my day job. I love being a professor, but I don't think I would be doing this type of work if it wasn't for the survivors in the movement who inspire me every single day. Um, so, yeah, honestly. So I, um, yeah, I'm excited to be included and, and asked about all this lovely expertise that I've been able to gain. Well, research is such a big component of the field. And I think for the general public, which is who's going to be viewing a lot of our stuff, I think not being aware of, of the role that data plays is, um, it's just so crucial. And, you know, research and data is a component of our congressional toolkits recommendation. And it, without getting really good data, it's hard to figure out what to target and where to look and are programs working and... Um, it's just so crucial. So I wanted to bring you on because you guys do perform a lot of data. Is it performing? Is it in, is it research? Gather, Gather? <laughs> gathering. Yeah. You can tell yeah. I'm not a data person. I'm like, do you do data? <laughs> what do we do? We're <laughs> gathering okay. data. That's what we do. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, this is a myth buster campaign. We're trying to help the general public learn a lot more about how to find good data, where to look. And that's the thing that I hear the most from when we talk to people, they want to know, they want to know, but it, there's so much out there. How do you differentiate between good data and maybe someone who is resharing something that maybe isn't accurate? Like, where do you find good data? Where is the first places you look? And then how can, what can, suggestions can you give for others? That is an amazing question. I'm so glad to be asked. I'm so glad that this information is going outside of my classroom walls because my students, I'm sure, are sick of hearing about it. <laughs> um, but especially when it comes to things like sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, we don't, we rely on a lot of those myths and we, we feed off of them. And so one of the things that happens when we see stuff shared on social media is that it feeds into our confirmation bias. Mm. We have these preconceived notions that often come from, you know, fiction in movies, right? Mm -hmm. Or books that we've read that are not based on true stories. And we look for information that's just going to confirm that bias that we already have. Mm. And a way to directly counteract that is to look for where good data has been collected. And where you can find that information um, is when you look to professors who have done the research or survivor leaders who have done the research 
And I always tell students, and, and I know this might seem daunting to the average person, but it's really not. Literally, scholar.google.com and put in whatever you're curious about, right? So if you find something shared on social media that you're like, huh, I wonder if that's real. Pause, go to scholar.google.com and look it up, right? If they cite a study in that, in that, um, in that news report, and to be perfectly honest with you, if you're resharing something that doesn't have a study <laughs> that's been cited, it's probably not true. Um, unless it's coming from a survivor, to be honest with you, I'm sharing, you know, their perspective because they're the ones with the lived experience, right? But scholar.google.com put in who buys sex, put in, you know, sex trafficking in the United States, and you would be shocked at the, the amount of information that comes up that is written by actual researchers who have ethical standards that they're held to. Yeah, I think that's really good to point out the ethical standards that researchers are held to is is very different now some of the things that i know help as well is when we're also getting government kind of reported data and and i would love to hear i'm guessing but obviously i'd love to hear from you when we see reports from otip which is the office of trafficking and persons for those that, that don't know the acronym or when we see um you know data come out from uh, BJA, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, can we trust that at some point a research component may have been required of them to perform that analysis or walk us through how government entities work that are beyond, like researchers feels like broad, are we talking about just universities or government or yeah. where's that um, industry held, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So folks that are gonna be hired to do that kind of work and that kind of research, they absolutely have the same credentials that a professor would have, absolutely. Um, so a lot of those government publications, you can rely on the information that's published there. Now, I don't want to get into the nuance, but if we're looking at just police reports um, or court records, those are going to be tricky because if you've got a trafficking situation, what actually ends up happening in the arrest and then sometimes in the conviction, that trafficking charge is dropped. Totally dropped. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to appear as something else. So that's totally. not really an accurate representation no. of all of the trafficking that's going on. Um, it, it presents as domestic violence or it presents as a drug trafficking scenario. And it's really, there's so much more going on. Absolutely. But yes, those government reports. And I will say that the trafficking in persons report that the U.S. puts out, you know, there are flaws in it, right? For there, sure. There's some politics behind it. Um, but if you have enough sources, if you look at the TIP report that this government puts out and you can find similar trends in other ones, and I know that seems daunting, but it's a skill that, you know, it, you learn in, in undergrad and graduate school look across sources and if you're seeing the same stuff then you can you can make the conclusion that it's reliable one thing i always tell my students is you can have a story you can have an experience sitting in my classroom like i'm not racist because i have black friends okay your feeling your perspective is valid because it's it's your feeling and your perspective as an n of one one person mm -hmm. but unless it's replicated over and over it's not really science Right? right. So right. it can be valid, but not necessarily reliable. Is it replicable? That's really what we're looking for. And that's what people should learn how to do. Right. And I mean, you bring up a good point that that's something that we, when I posted my most recent post that led to us yeah. creating this campaign, we had a lot of naysayers that would comment on my, um, on my photo, my post, my cat, whatever, caption, whatever it's called. Yeah. And they would say like, well, that's just your one lived experience. And my, my response to that is, um, you know, it's actually really hard to be considered an expert. I know even with survivor leaders, sometimes that is our, our one lived experience or our one sure. um, perspective, but to get sworn in on the stand as a human trafficking expert, which I have done multiple, yeah. multiple times, that's not easy to get. And, no. and I have to prove that I know more than just my one experience, that I have these dozens of other commonalities that I can um, get, you know, lean on and, and identify as common tactics and recruitment mm -hmm. tactics that aren't not just mine, but from the hundreds of pro possible victims that we've served and hundreds of thousands of law enforcement officers that I have um, trained or collaborated with on, on multiple occasions. I, I took the stand, it was almost probably four hours once undergoing to be approved by a judge or not as a deemed expert. That's not easy. And no. so it, it cracks me up when people are like, that's your one experience. I'm like, do you know how Actually, hard it was to get my behind in that stand? Screw you. I worked 10 years to get this expert yeah. title. Yeah. I don't have that title. It's incredibly hard to do. 
I, you know, and, and people might look at my credentials and be like, of course, she knows what she's talking about. Actually, you need to listen to survivors. Survivors have lived experience. If they have what we call it in the research world is triangulating your data. Mm. So if you've gathered data, you've talked to survivors, you've worked with law enforcement, you've interviewed buyers, you understand trafficking, you understand the trafficker mindset, that's triangulated data. And there's no better expertise in the world if you've got that level of experience. Yeah, I often say sometimes like, other than the, the buyer, the trafficker, and the, and the victim at the time, everyone else is just bringing you hearsay. <laughs> like really, you know? Um, but there's a couple other things that I thought would be really great to get into. And it's, and it's not to, ho hopefully this um, series f is really helpful for the public. We don't want to shame anyone. We don't want to be the human trafficking police telling everyone they're wrong. That's not our, our goal. Our goal is to help give people um, tools and equip them to be really thoughtful around situations. So I would say that some of the things I'm seeing more recently have been statistics that are true statistics, but like the context of the research isn't being brought into the subject. And so it's almost like a little bit of truth mixed into this myth, you know, and, and here's my one example, and I'd love for you to speak to this. because I'm so curious on your perspective. Um, NICMEC, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, known as NICMEC, NICMEC has reported 800,000 children missing on their, on their reports. What I've seen people then take that one statistic and do is say, oh, 800,000 U.S. children vanished. And you're like, mm, that's, that's actually not that's not totally how it happened, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. I feel like, or saying, you know, my, my city's the largest trafficking hub in the world. The hotline showed me as number one. And it's like, well, that's the number one call centered. Like, talk mm -hmm. to us about the context of research and why yeah. it matters beyond just seeing a number and running with it. You have to understand how those data were collected. If you don't understand how they were collected, you cannot make assumptions or interpretations about them. So when I show, when we do local training here in Colorado, I show the Polaris map of where the hotline, um, <clears throat> you know, the heat, it's a heat map. Mm -hmm. And it shows right on I-25, which splits the state right down the middle along the front range, that that's a hot spot. And right up where we are in Northern Colorado is, is a hot spot as well. And, and what people need to understand is the hotline is representing People who call in either with tips or their survivors or victims who were like, hey, I need some resources, right? So mm -hmm. what that represents is potentially like, wow, people are really well educated. There's been a lot of human trafficking awareness in that state. And so it's going to look like there's a lot of activity there. If you look at the Western Slope, which is, you know, the, on the other side of the mountain range, um, we know based on our research that Megan and I have conducted that there is a ton of trafficking activity going on over there. Um, she was, Megan was trafficked over there, so she knows firsthand, and we've got this demand data, but it's not lit up on the Polaris screen. It's not a heat map. Why? Because there's very little awareness. People aren't calling in. People out there don't, and if you're a trafficking victim, you're not calling in like, hey, hey, I'm being trafficked. Can I get, can somebody help me out? Like, that's not <laughs> how it works, right? right. And so when you're looking at those, you have to dig further, just go to the method section of that report. How were these data collected? Right. And, and for a lot oh, of that's folks, a good tip, go to the method section. I love or that the abstract. The abstract will say that. Okay. Right? Abstract say, like, and methods, listeners, yeah. viewers note <laughs> that go to the, go read the, if you see a stat that comes up and it looks like, wow, that is really extreme. Is your first yeah. thought? Yeah, it, it might be. So go find the actual report. Hopefully it's cited. And then you go right down to methods. You could even do control find and type methods yeah. abstract and see what pops up. Yeah. And if that's too much work, send me an email. This sort of, <laughs> these sorts of questions literally make my day when people are like, what am I looking at here? Like for a nerd like me to get those questions, it makes my day. I'd love to help people interpret uh, those sorts of questions. So <laughs> tell us some other stats that are out there that you hear a lot that you're like, A, it's too old. So how do we recognize, you know, relevant data? And B, um, there's not really any citable source for that. I can think of a few, but I, I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> oh, man. There's too many, Rebecca, honestly. Average um, age of um, entry. Oh, here we go. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so the data that exists on average age of entry, which people throw around between 11 and 13 years old. Listen, everybody. This data is from people who were identified as juveniles. 
right? So they're on average, that number is gonna be lower. We're not talking about adult trafficking survivors who were recruited 18, 19, 20 years old. We don't have, there's no national registry for these individuals. So that number, that average is gonna be skewed low, 11 to right. 13 years old. Does that mean, you know, oh, well, we don't need to worry about 11 to 13 year olds? No, we absolutely need to worry about right. 11 to 13 year olds. But in, in thinking about like the average trafficking victim that first of all, the majority that in our sample that we've interviewed didn't identify as a trafficking victim until long after their exploitation ended. Yeah. So if you're, if, if you're walking around and you are experience this, experiencing this horrific exploitation, you're like, well, this didn't happen when I was 11 to 13. There was no, you know, whatever. I'm not, this isn't trafficking. Right. That's the problem. If, if you gloss over reality and you look at statistics that are skewed and that are old and are based on just a juvenile sample, people who, you know, came in contact with some sort of system, all of these individuals are walking around not identifying that way at all. And they're never going to think that they deserve to leave, that they deserve to get out, or that what they're experiencing is actually exploitation or trafficking. Right. That's a huge problem. I didn't self-identify for a very long time. I've actually been quoted in a book in the UK because I ran to the UK after I left my trafficker. Yeah. So I was very fresh out of the life, still living with a buyer. I call it my Richard Gear year. And... <laughs> Just because it rolls off the tongue easy. Yeah. I, Richard Gere has nothing to do with it. Don't start a statistic about yeah. him. <laughs> um, but I, get, I got quoted in that saying, um, I was forced into prostitution, but not a trafficking survivor. Yep. Because I, I didn't identify because I only pictured kidnapped 13-year-olds. Yep. And I thought, well, I was 19. My boyfriend loved me. I, I just, it's like I was okay saying that someone I trusted forced me into prostitution, but I felt like human trafficking was reserved for children. Mm -hmm. I just had this weird disconnect in my brain still. I think so early in my recovery, I still had never seen a therapist. I was only a few months out of, out of it. And I went on the record at some public event at Oxford University oh. and was quoted in a book called The Equality Illusion by Kat Banyard. And it's oh, man. literally her opening line on her Amazon page is my quote <laughs> with my maiden no. name. And I just like, this is why going forward too soon with your story is like paramount in my speeches because <laughs> you're just saying yeah. things through your colored lens still. And, you know, the other thing that you know, if, if my students were listening to this, they would be like, oh, my God, she's talking about this again. The other thing that I think is so important to understand when we're talking about sexual exploitation and sex trafficking is this little thing called life course theory. Life course theory helps us understand the precursors to exploitation, what's going on when the exploitation happens, how people identify during the exploitation, and then afterwards the healing process and what's needed to heal. It's good. During, during this exploitation, I'm gonna ask you, would you have identified as a sex worker during hmm. your exploitation? Probably. Megan says the same thing, and it absolutely makes sense. So folks who are saying that sex work is work, of course, yeah, absolutely. But life right. course theory suggests like what was leading up to that, right? And a lot so of good. research, a lot of research shows that there was some history of sexual abuse or sexual assault that precedes all, right? Not all, maybe ninety percent ish right. of uh, victims. And then once you exit, and you're like, whoa no, that's not what was going on at all. Totally. I was under the control of a trafficker. You're going to, your story's going to change. Not or change, my choices, even if I don't, even if I was keeping the money and the trafficker wasn't taking it, my quote unquote, quote unquote choice was very limited, which led yeah. me to actually a lack of options got me into exploitation. I think I, I hesitated because the term sex work wasn't really used back when I was there. Sure. I yeah. would have, I would have just said I was a hoe. That's <laughs> literally like, <laughs> and that's in our book. Actually, we yeah. say when, when one of the girls that I was trafficked with was able to get out and we started talking and I said, I think we were trafficked. And she was like, girl, you're off in left field. We were just hoes. And I was like, yeah. and I put that in the book. I think I may have said prostitutes to not be so um, yeah. degrading because I think it's a horrible word, but yeah. it still showed that difference, even in that moment between two girls trafficked together by the same trafficker, yeah. one further along in that life course cycle, I love you bring up, yeah. and one right directly out and still identifying their circumstances very different. Wow. But now, but now identifies as a trafficking survivor, right? And now both very active survivors. Exactly. You know Rebecca Charleston. I do. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things that you brought up that made me 
it's, I mean, I love this kind of stuff because I think it's so, so paramount when you're talking about that. So there's a study here in the, um, in Oregon put on by a researcher, Dr. Chris Carey out of Portland State University. It's a statistic on um, 95% of trafficked teens had been in foster care since age two in the state of Oregon, 95%. Very shocking, very true. But also, the more you dig into the methodology, it's uh-huh. that those who had been identified as trafficked and, um, and research, because this Portland State University put on this research, they all, the data was collected from child welfare. Exactly. So... Right. Of course, it's going to be higher. I mean, I still think it's probably pretty high. It, you know, yeah. I mean, we all know that foster care makes a lot, a lot oh. of vulnerabilities. It's not yeah. the, it's not that there's a gateway from foster care to tra- foster right. child welfare isn't selling children. When people right. hear foster care is a gateway, it's like they blame the government is doing it. And you're like, no, right. no, kids right. in foster care are higher risk. But it's that methodology. It's like, well, of right. course it's going to be high. You're getting all of the data from child welfare. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there's so much data that we just do not have when it comes to something like this. Like we just do not have enough information. There's no national register. So the data is going to be a little bit skewed. Um, but yeah, it's, foster care is definitely one of those vulnerabilities. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that's been shown in other research too. That's the other piece for those who are listening. Like if you read something, you're like, whoa, whoa, hold on go and f- try to find similar work and see if they found the same thing. And, and if you find the same sort of information, then chances are there's some, some validity there. Yeah. So, you know, just to continue kind of the dialogue around this, um, some of the other data that we see coming out a lot is like average lifespan is seven years, um, the average age of entry 12 to 14, 800,000 children vanished. Like all of these really fairly extreme um, traffic, you know, Super Bowl is the largest trafficking day of the year. Um, what are some other ones? My city's the biggest hub. All of these things that I'm always like, I don't know that that's citable. Like I've tried to find some of the data on this and I'm, it's like you can never find the original source of research that took place. It's just everyone passing it around. Right. So yeah, what are what are some thoughts you have on some of those and how people can can start being doing their due diligence before we yeah. just reshare? An easy way, well, if if you want to do due diligence, try to find the the original article. If it's a if it's a reliable source, if it's a reliable like the Associated Press, right? They're going to put hyperlinks in their story to the yep. original study, so yep. you can just click on it and go right there and exactly. read it yourself and look at the method right? If there's no hyperlinks, then you're like, huh, if it's turned into a meme, then you really need to start wondering like, (laughs) how what's going on? We had, so when I posted that I believed that Wayfair was not accurate, um, we had a lot of people commenting and saying, um, that's only your one lived experience. You can't speak for child sex rings and we'll only believe it if like a special agent who did the investigation says so. And so I brought him on. (laughs) i'm like okay here he is he tell us joe tell us about your investigation of wayfair and he does and and we'll be coming out with that i shared a snippet on instagram oh joe scaramucci Mm -hmm. yeah and people were like i need more than one and so you're like (laughs) how many times do experts and survivor leaders and researchers and professors and Mm -hmm. agents have to tell you before you, is it just, I, I don't understand. Is it the people don't want to admit they maybe were wrong? They don't want to say like, oh, maybe I jumped the gun on that. And I go tell my friends I was wrong or yeah, what is it's, that? It's confirmation bias, first of all. <laughs> okay. They're looking for stuff to confirm the bias that they already have because do, going, thinking outside the box is too hard. Thank you again so yeah. much. I could talk to you all day. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time so I don't yeah. keep you too long, but I just really appreciate your insight and expertise on how we can all do better. We can do better. I have hope we're going to do better. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Yep. Thanks for having me. I am so excited, you guys, to bring you a good friend of mine, but more than that, a leading subject matter expert in this field. Please welcome Elizabeth Scaife. Hi, everyone. I want to ask you, with, um, with so many, there's just information coming in from everywhere right now. And so I know that most of the people that might be tuning in 
Um, you may have reshared some of these things and I don't want anybody to feel embarrassed or ashamed. Elizabeth herself admitted like, yeah, when I first started, I shared some of those things too, or I had these ideas too. You have right now in this time, we have more information coming at us than ever before. And it's really hard to yes. sort through like, well, what's truth? What's not truth? I've seen people share things that I know and trust and respect that are completely inaccurate. And I'm like, yeah. oh shoot, people are believing what they're saying because they, they're credible in other circles. So then they think they must be credible in this content as well. Yeah. And so I want to hear from you a little bit about some of those misconceptions around you know, the, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, you're right in the same city that they're in. You've, you worked hand in hand, you have colleagues that you've worked with for years there. Share with us a little bit about this report that comes out with 800,000 missing children and what people need to be thoughtful of when they get any kind of report, any kind of data, any kind of statistic. How do you sort through the mess? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's not easy. Let me preface all of this by saying there's really no easy way to get credible. There's, it's impossible to have entirely accurate, entirely credible, up-to-date data. It's impossible on this subject. And, and I'll say why, right? Um, because I think we, there are groups that are doing the best they can, but we are limited by quite a few things. And so I... I'm with you that I see people reusing statistics that are incorrect all the time. And some of that comes down to copying and pasting what they see on a website. It sounds good and it's a credible organization. And so they copy and paste it and they never go look and see where it came from. And that organization copied and pasted it from someone else that they thought was credible. And they pulled it from a report from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, even right. worse. There's some statistics, statistics from 30 years ago that are consistently reused. And, and I find that very frustrating. And so um, when we think about reading and, and getting into research, then you really need to look at where the source is. And if they don't have it cited on the website, um, or if, it, if they don't have a report um, that, that includes the information, then that statistic didn't come from them. And so then it should be cited. And if it's not cited on their, on their website, then don't use it ever. Right. But, or, or email them and ask, hey, where'd you get this statistics? Love to use this. Can you provide me some information? Don't just copy and paste because the danger of taking unsighted and unverified or poor methodology based research yes. is that we, what we want to do, our, our, our motivations are positive, right? What we want to do is capture attention. And that's usually why we're using statistics and research-based points. We wanna capture attention. And we operate under this mentality that it's not enough to say that this, this young boy or girl was trafficked in our city. We have to say that the age of entry into prostitution is 10 and 11 for all boys and, you know, or 12 years old for all girls and 300,000 victims have been abused. Like we feel like we have to do these really like, you know, exponentially large or really serious numbers yeah. and you don't, right? And so to your question related to data and statistics, always figure out where the original source is. And if it was, if it's cited to an organization or a website, go to that organization or website. This is what people don't want to do. We get very lazy, which is why we're constantly using the wrong data. Go to that organization or website that's been cited and see where their citation is. And if they have a citation, and I guarantee you're going to find this bunny trail goes back to the same places, which are some national organizations. Uh, the most credible information that you can find nationally is usually from FBI, DOJ, OVC, I'm going to say all these acronyms short, NICMIC, which is N-C-M-E-C, um, Shared Hope International, Polaris, Liberty Shared, I'm just going to say all these, right? So take notes, um, Department of Labor, uh, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, HEAL, H-E-A-L, HEAL Trafficking, uh, Freedom Collaborative, and then even the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime is, is a great resource. Those are my favorite resources for credible, evidence-based, well-collected information. However, <laughs> nobody has all of the information and that's the problem. So while their statistics are credible and their research is valid, uh, there's still loopholes to be found. So for example, Polaris, I think, has is, is been in this fight for uh, they're one of the pioneers in this industry. Their data comes from their hotline. 
the hotline is very credible source of information. However, the hotline, it's not their job to go and verify every single tip and lead that comes through the hotline. What their job is, is to take calls and to provide referrals and resources and to gather enough information about the report that they then create a case and pass it over to law enforcement, right? So their information is, it's not that it's non-verified or that it's, it's, it's not credible. It's, it's very credible. They do a very good job of, of thoroughly vetting stuff, maybe a little too thoroughly sometimes, but they have no idea if those turn out to be verified cases, okay? Right. So when we focus on the hotline data, there's a problem. FBI is gathering, or the DOJ, any federal agency is typically gathering mostly federal data. They are not trickling down and gathering everything from states. They've, tried, they've started to try to do that. But there's a huge disconnect, most people don't realize this, between, not everybody plays together in the sandbox, okay? So between state and federal law enforcement, there's a huge disconnect in information sharing. There's a huge disconnect in information sharing between law enforcement and service providers. And so you've got service providers who have an exponential number of victims they've served, but not all those victims have opened a case or an investigation against their trafficker. Right. So that data is not calculated in law enforcement numbers. And so what I'm saying is, it's you can't have one source of information. You have to look at multiple sources nor should you ever have one source. We have discussed in DC over the last several years the need for some evidence-based research around data collection, but it has been stymied and, and bottlenecked because when you get all the important people around the table, you then have to agree on the definitions of trafficking. Who's a victim? How do we define them? What defines trafficking versus exploit? You know, you have to agree on all the things in order right. to do your research, right? right? So the collection of statistics is, is a, a little wild. And, in, and then it comes down to, in some places, even if the federal government, which they've done in the last few years, have launched systems for collecting statistics from law enforcement, not every state is, has the funds or the capacity or the personnel to lock that information in that system. So right. that's problem A. Problem B would be, even within their reporting structure, they haven't updated their systems to add a human trafficking offense. So if someone's arrested for kidnapping for the, under their state law for the purposes of sexual exploitation, which is their trafficking law, that's gonna go under a kidnapping offense. It's not gonna go under human trafficking offense, you follow me? And so all across the board, um, it's not that data is not reliable, it's just that you really have to be very careful and diligent in looking at your sources and they should have a citation. And frankly speaking, if you're ever, it, this is like, this is my soapbox now, if you're using data and statistics, why are you not looking at stuff that was released in the last five years? Please, for the love of everything, don't pull out some statistics from 20 years ago and tout them as recent. It's just not true. So can I touch on the missing kids stuff real quick? I would I, love, I would love you too, because I think this is, I mean, what you said was just great. We have to go make sure there's a citable source, go read it for yourself, make sure it's recent. If you are going to post something yourself, you cite your site source. You're not just going to cite Sally Joe from Instagram because she's your friend. Like, yeah. go find the source, go read it, go make sure, and then look at the methodology, which is another thing that we had, you know, we're, we're talking through before was like, you know, how was it collected? Like you're talking about the call center, right? If it's all just tips, we can't say, oh, the biggest city for trafficking in 2019 was Dallas, Texas. Like, Correct. Well, how do you know that? Well, the hotline. You're like, right. okay. <laughs> totally. Let me, pull, let me pull that string a little. So the people that call the hotline, how do they know to call the hotline? They saw a poster somewhere. They, they took a little course or a class on human trafficking. They understand the indicators and now it's fresh in their mind, right? We know across the board, anytime training and awareness at a community level is elevated, training for professionals is elevated, tips and leads will automatically elevate, right? Absolutely. Suddenly, People will be thinking about it. They will be making more calls and more leads. So when we see an explosion in numbers, uh, for example, which, which year was that? There, there were, uh, I was reading about this recently where all of a sudden um, child exploitation cases went up like 40% um, when, when some new system was introduced. And I guess I wish I wish I could remember what it was, but it doesn't matter. But 40% uh, in a year, and I'm thinking, or within a couple of years, it's like, I know all of a sudden, you know, we didn't suddenly see a 40% increase in child trafficking. But there has been a massive amount of policy change and training and awareness and uh, victim-centered approaches and now services and support. When all that stuff rises up, then reports do too. Um, so I highly encourage state-based and regional reports because states across the country, you know, we only have 
Research is done when people can afford to do it. No right. one wants to fund research. Guys. Right. Like when you're choosing between right. services and support for victims or $200,000 for a local research project over the next three years, what are you going to fund? It's right? always so hard. And, and rightfully so, right? Like if you have a kid in front of you that's hungry and needs a place to stay, oh. like you're helping the person. And so research oh. becomes a secondary thing for direct yes. service providers oftentimes, but then it doesn't help because then all of these numbers that get shared aren't accurate. Yes. They were really old. They weren't well-funded yes. or no one has had any more funding to redo that report or to collaborate mm -hmm. with other states. And so keep yes. going statewide. Yeah, research. yeah. So it's tough, right? And then that impacts their ability to apply for funding. If you can't demonstrate by your numbers, it's kind of like, ah! Right. So, um, yeah. So, I would, I would love to see this report on 800,000 kids. I like, I'm, I'm open-minded, but I'm entirely skeptical. Uh, first of all, what I know for a fact is that kids, kids, anyone under 18 is reported missing in two places. First of all, it's the National Crime Information Center. That's law enforcement specific information. And then also um, during the Obama administration, it became required that they report to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, right? So there are two places where these reports are entered. And so the data is largely parallel for both of those on an annual basis. The NCIC reports are a little different because there, it's it's not worth getting into, but there, it's not that their numbers aren't accurate. They just handle their system differently, so the numbers appear differently. So NCMEC is they have more, they probably have more oversight and how they do their numbers, and they're able to pull more accurate data, right? And so, as far as we know, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, there are somewhere between 25 and 29 thousand kids that go missing every year. Now, let me be clear: the majority of them, like like 94% of them are recovered within one to six weeks from when they go missing, right? And the majority of the kids who go missing are runaways, most of whom are chronic runaways, most of whom are female chronic runaways. And so with 94% of them recovered within those first few weeks, and then the bulk of them in general recovered within a, another amount of time. And so it's not that we have 800,000 missing kids at any given time. Somebody's calculating something wrong because it's just not realistic. Um, and also they don't stay on the streets, but the endangered runaway issue, if you want to compare it or delineate it specifically to child sex trafficking, Nick Mick would say, and they use a very rigorous and I think very credible and trusted approach, uh, that one out of six of the runaways that they consider endangered um, are, they, they believe to be victims of trafficking. An endangered runaway includes a child who, who has run from custody that has a few very vulnerable factors that are attached to them. Could be a mental illness, could be that the child is pregnant, could be that they're carrying a weapon, that they've been gang involved, could be that they've been identified or believed to be a high risk high risk for child sex trafficking. There, there are like 11 endangering factors related to these kids. And so they screen for those. And if they're marked as high, high endangered out of the screening protocol, then out of that, that group that's all been marked endangered, one out of six is their estimate that will be trafficked at some point. Or that they believe is all is already a traffic already in the classify and they have and they're not loose with their data out of their twenty nine thousand ish victims or or I'm sorry I shouldn't say victims the kids who go missing ninety one percent of them are in classified as endangered so the bulk wow. of them are endangered for quite a few different reasons however almost all of them are recovered. Um, within six weeks, guys. And so just, and, and they are, they're, they're not counting the number of times a child was reported. The NCIC, the other system, they count every report that goes in. Oh, and so they're, regardless if it's the same kid. Yeah, oh. if they make an update to the file, a, a, a number gets added. They're counting accesses to the files, basically. Gotcha. Instances that the file was updated. And so wow. that's why those numbers, they're not, they're, they're not er erroneous, they're just different, right? But NCMEC has individual cases. And so again, it's not enough to ever just look at a number by the sensationalism of it, do some back background research for crying out loud before you pass it along to anyone. Thank you. We just heard from Dr. Angie Henderson and Elizabeth Scaife on some incredible ways to know how to look through data, what is out there in terms of data. You have worked with child trafficking victims, specifically victims of exploitation and, and child trafficking that are caught in the criminal juvenile justice system. For people that are tuning in, can you just walk us through 
like that process and share with us a little bit more about how some of those numbers are reported specifically within juvenile justice. My experience has been working with sex trafficking victims that are caught up in the juvenile justice system is they typically um, get a first criminal charge that has to do while they're being trafficked and during their trafficking. So whether that be a possession charge because their boyfriend is making them hold their drugs, whether it's assist in a grand theft auto, whatever that looks like, they end up in the juvenile justice system. Now they're going to court. Now they're on probation. And boyfriend, um, air quotes, boyfriend. We're all knowing it's the trafficker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once a child is on probation, there are different charges that a juvenile uh, can be charged with an adult can't, and they're called status offenses. Okay. And those are basically, they can get picked up for not going to school as a violation of probation, uh, running away as a violation, actually causing disruption in the home. The parents can call uh, in a report. And of course, once a charge comes a warrant, then the child is picked up on that warrant. So whether it's that the child ran away, the child didn't go to school, it's all tends truancy. to be caught away. Is that considered like a truancy charge or a curfew if they're out after midnight? And, yeah. and, and in some states, I, I've heard them referred to an organ as a pickup order as opposed to a warrant because that can sound so intense. Do you, is it something similar? I know we have a lot of states tuning in, so just wanting to like... Yeah. And we're following. Right. Okay. So a kid's being trafficked, kids ran, a kid's being trafficked. They've been identified as being trafficked or exploited, but they keep running away with their boyfriend and the parents keep calling and saying she ran away again, or, or maybe she gets picked up at a shopping mall for shoplifting and another charge is added. So keep going. Sorry. I'm following. I just wanting, I, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure I'm following. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yes, a pickup order is the same thing as a warrant. You're right. Okay. Vocabulary is different when you're dealing with the juvenile justice system. It's the same thing when you hear the word commitment. Really what that means is prison. <laughs> it means prison sentence. Love they that. call it a commitment program when you're a child. Oh. So what happens is, say for instance, a child comes home 30 minutes after curfew. The parents have already called uh, in a report. The pickup order goes in and that report is called in as a runaway. Okay. typically. You know, they always say run away, like, oh, my child ran away because they're not home by curfew. Um, and so we get runaway reports when children are missing for maybe five hours sometimes. It doesn't have to be that they're gone for this long period of time. Oh. So what ends up happening is between, you have all these different systems that are working together. So between the police department and the parents and uh, intake at the juvenile justice system, it all tends to look like runaway. And a lot of the children I worked with would get a quote unquote runaway charge or a curfew violation anywhere from there even. So sometimes they actually are going to DJJ. There's 15 to 20 pickup orders, which means they're intake to go to kitty jail. And so at that point, what happens is that, of course, gets recorded. All their intakes get recorded. And what ends up getting skewed, where the numbers sometimes look bigger, is if it's not in the report, if it's not done by file, it's done by amount of counts. So if you have one child that has 15 accounts of a runaway, it's not 15 different cases of a runaway. Oh, See what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so earlier, Elizabeth Scape was talking to us about how some reports, like the NCIC's report, reports on number of times that file was accessed versus in the NCMEC report, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, they report how many files. So how many times the file was accessed, how many files. You're sharing with us how a file gets accessed is not only potential tip lines, but also if they run away again and the parents report them and they've already called and the kid shows up an hour later, another number gets added to that data? Yes. So just like a warrant, once a pickup order gets issued, it can't be backtracked. Like they have to go through the process. So the child gets picked up, goes to the DJJ facility, goes to intake overnight to do first appearance the next morning, wow. so on. And so forth. You can't, I mean, I find that so frustrating to just be like, no, just cancel. I can cancel a charge on my credit card. I can cancel 
my kid came home, just cancel the order and they won't do it. They'll take the kid in. Yes. And then what becomes the problem is, um, it's scored. So the more times a child is in front of a judge, their score gets higher and the higher they're scored, they end up being scored for what I said is called commitment programs where they do long-term time. Sometimes, um, you know, it can be up to two years. They'll be 18 before they come out. So a lot of the kids that I worked with are literally like institutionalized in this like cycle of being institutionalized from the time they're like 13 to 18. And this whole time they're being trafficked, which is why these status offenses are happening. So, and which is why they keep running away. Correct. Correct. Keep going. Yeah. The access on those files um, looks very different than just counting a file, obviously. So the NCIC numbers go, they go way up. When we talk about um, verifying children as victims of sex trafficking, uh, your state has a Department of Child Welfare that would be in charge of doing that. Now, every state is different. Not every state has what's called a human trafficking tool, but many states do now, where if a child is flagged as high risk or has previously been identified as a trafficking victim, they take this HT toolkit every time they go back to djj and djj is the department of juvenile justice so can correct you- the correction okay. facility so from the pickup order the police are driving them to djj they're doing intake and part of that intake can be what's called the human trafficking toolkit which is a list of 50 questions that are asked and then the person the social worker tallies up the score and it's you know not likely possible high risk, yes, we think this is happening. So here again, I'm working with one child who gets arrested 20 times, gets picked up 20 times in a year, and 15 of those 20 times they're doing a human trafficking toolkit when they get to the facility. So again, if you're counting accesses as opposed to a single file, now, excuse me, it looks like you have 15 trafficking survivors or victims as opposed to one, but that's not actually what is happening. I know, crazy. It's insane. It gets deeper though. So that's not where we see the skew of the numbers of understanding how many children are actually victims of sex trafficking in our state. And this is the reason why. This toolkit is a combination of 50 very personal questions that are asked of a child when they enter a correction facility by a complete stranger. So as a advocate and social worker specifically designated for human trafficking victims, I would start working with a child and know immediately that they were being trafficked by what they tell me, by their behavior. As soon as we would uh, make a rapport, I would know what was going on. Right. But every time they get picked up to go into DJJ, they're not telling the truth, not answering those. I wouldn't answer some of those questions to a complete stranger. It's insane what they ask. I can't, I don't even want to say it on this podcast. Some of the questions that they ask these children about wow. their sexual history, if they have STDs, all that kind of stuff. So the child, if the child does not answer the questions, honestly, then the Department of Children and Families within 60 days, this is in the state of Florida, it does vary per state, will close the case. And then the child is not verified, which then becomes a big problem because if the child is not verified, then we can't connect them to human trafficking specific services. If the child is not verified. You have this giant swing of like some numbers none of the, some of those people are trafficked and just didn't want to answer some of the questions. And some numbers are counted as 15 victims when it was only one. And that's why we're seeing these differences in reports of like 450,000 kids, one report says versus the other reports, like there was 29,000 children. Now, now mind you, one is, one is enough. One is enough. It's not that. It's just that when we're seeing all this stuff on the internet and people are resharing really large numbers, make sure you go read how this report was gathered. Because I think Tara just gave a great, like boots on the ground, tangible example of why those numbers in different reports can, can vary. Um, 
we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Like Tara said, time is so valuable. It's a resource that we do not take lightly. Thank you for taking the time to learn from survivors, to learn from leading experts and advocates and, and professors and law enforcement and DAs. And um, we're just grateful you're here learning. We're grateful that you're even interested in this. We've been fighting this a long time and we want you to be a part. So we want to thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right, you guys, that's a wrap. We are done with Mythbusters. I want to give one more shout out to our sponsor, Reality Check It. Also, I want to plug, obviously, Elevate Academy. If you want to sponsor a survivor, visit it, us at elevate-academy.org. And make sure that after this IGTV series is over, that you check out the YouTube videos as well as the podcast. Um, and again, hashtag Reality Check It. <laughs> Thanks again. Have you ever wondered what it's like to start over with nothing? Human trafficking, it's the largest social justice issue of our time. What happens to women and children after they escape, after they complete a program? How do you start life over again with a renewed sense of purpose? Elevate Academy was birthed from that. Elevate is an online school that offers courses, mentors, small groups, in-person chapters, homework activities, and job opportunities so that survivors of human trafficking can start to actually dream again and then create steps to get there. By partnering with us financially every month for one year, you not only change the course of a survivor's life, but also her children and her children's children. But it doesn't stop there. 